Oh, you were, weren't you? I knew. <laughs> when you said, I was like, thank, thank, thank you, Kurt. <laughs> Very good. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome into O'Neill's Grill for our weekly Fan and Press Lunch. And we're delighted to be here on this Tuesday because that means the college football season for the Dukes of James Madison continues. And uh, first of all, before we get to Coach Houston here this afternoon, we've got a number of things I want to uh, give you uh, coming up on JMU Sports in particular. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kurt Dudley, and again, glad to have you here at O'Neill's Grill. Uh, tonight, we do have JMU men's basketball at home. Dukes have been on the road for their last five contests, so they are home tonight. They begin a five-game home, five homestand, and tonight's competition, the Richmond Spiders. Spiders come in with a record of five and five, and tonight's meeting will be the 55th all time between the two programs. And again, this is the first of five consecutive home games stretching between now and January the 2nd. Women's basketball has been on an extended break. They've been off for 16 days. They get back on the court tomorrow morning. It's an 11 a.m. tip off, and uh, they're going to play at St. John's up on Long Island. And you can watch that on ESPN3. Of course, you can also hear that through the JMU Sprint Broadcast Network. Pre-game coverage begins at 11, at 10.30 a.m., that is, with Craig Orndorff, and that's on ESPN 1360 and 101.3 uh, FM. Of course, uh, tonight's men's basketball game also on the JMU Sprint Broadcast Network, WSBA 550 AM, uh, 92.1 FM, and on Madison HD Sportsnet, free video as well as audio. And all that coverage begins at 6.30, video beginning at 7.00. All right, on to some football announcements, some honors won. Uh, senior running back Khalid Abdullah moved to second all-time on the JMU charts uh, with 180 yards rushing on Friday night, and uh, that uh, moves him to 3,577. And again, he is second all-time on the charts. And uh, he and redshirt senior Mitchell Kirsch named to the American Football Coaches Association All-America team yesterday. And that's the first time that two Dukes were named to that particular list in the history of the program, and they become number 13, uh, 14 and 15 since uh, dating back to 1977 to be so honored by the Coaches Association. Kirsch also is a member of the Walter Camp All-America team, which was also announced yesterday, as is return specialist Richard Davis. Brian Shore climbed into second on the all-time JMU charts for total offense, 3,433 and that's a combination of rusting and passing. Tyler Gray's 45-yard field goal that snapped the 17-all tie early in the fourth quarter Friday night. Uh, that was a career long for him and also establishes a JMU postseason record for distance. A couple of tickets uh, information updates. Uh, each school received 4,000 tickets as their allotment to sell. JMU sold out of its 4,000 in a hurry. And uh, Youngstown State, not so. They only uh, requested 1,000, so the other 3,000 came to James Madison. Those two were sold lickety split. So great job by the JMU Nation to buy at least 7,000 tickets. If you're still looking for tickets, I checked just a little while, you can go to ncaa.com backslash exchange. That's ncaa.com backslash exchange. That's kind of a bidding site, and uh, tickets this morning, there were a good number of them on there. They, the bids range from, or the ask that is, range from five, no, I'm sorry, the bids asked from five to $125. The range was from 60 to $1,000 in ask. So uh, if you're interested in getting some tickets, they still are available on the secondary market. Just how strong is the JMU Nation? Well, I've got a great example from this morning. Uh, Khalid Abdullah is one of 11 uh, candidates for the Football Championship Subdivision Fans' Choice Award put out by Hero Sports. Hero Sports is a relatively new uh, online organization co covering college sports, including a lot of FCS and JMU coverage. Well, this morning, uh, saw a little bit of activity on Facebook. Khalid was second among the 11 uh, co uh, contestants for this particular fan voting poll, and he was at 15%, and he trailed the leader who was from a uh, North Carolina A&T uh, at 11 o'clock this morning, he trailed by 800 votes. As I just checked before I came on up here to the podium, uh, he has uh, picked up 600 votes on the next contestant. So earlier this morning, again, he only had 15% of the vote. He's up to 32% of the vote total. So uh, fans, keep on voting for Khalid. Let's show him what the JMU Nation can do. Of course, Khalid's certainly very deserving of that. 
And if you're watching on Facebook Live today, just scroll down just a little bit. You'll see the icon there, the graphic about that vote. Go to their fan site. It's a little tough to find if you don't go through that link and you can vote for Khalid today. Again, he's up to 33% and trailing uh, the other contestant at 38% right now. So he's picked up a lot of ground today. So thank you, JMU Nation. Well, we're here again today because the Dukes are still playing football. And there's one more game remaining on the schedule, and that would take the Dukes to Frisco, Texas on January the 7th. Noon is the kickoff time Eastern. And let's bring in the gentleman who is leading these Dukes to that national championship game, Mike Houston. Mike. Thanks a lot. Thanks for being back out again this week. Uh, thanks again to Mo and O'Neills uh, for, for hosting us throughout this year. So. Uh, we're guaranteed to have at least one more of these uh, prior to the national championship game here in a couple of weeks. Uh, so uh, really excited to have that opportunity. But uh, what a special weekend this past weekend for uh, our football program uh, going into Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, and what I can honestly say is the most challenging environment I have ever had a team go and compete in. Uh, and I've uh, had the opportunity to be in a lot of different, uh, a lot of different venues and a lot of different uh, settings. They're supposed to be some of the most challenging in the country, but uh, I don't know that any of them anywhere in this country at any level uh, rivals uh, the atmosphere and the home field advantage uh, that uh, the Buffaloes or the Bison, excuse me, the Bison uh, are, are able to uh, have there at the Fargo Dome uh, at North Dakota State. So uh, I think uh, first off, I would say that uh, that is a credit to uh, their program, their institution, their fan base for creating uh, that atmosphere. And certainly their program has had a tremendous run over the last five years, uh, winning five back-to-back-to-back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back -to -back, uh, national championships. Uh, and uh, so for our program to go in there and, and be able to get a win the way we did and to play the kind of game that we did in order to get the win, uh, I think that is a very, very special win for our program, for our institution, and I think it easily has to go down as one of the greatest all-time wins in JMU football history. So uh, very proud of our players, very proud of our coaches, uh, the, the guts, the resiliency, uh, the toughness that they demonstrated uh, in playing against what is considered to be one of the most physical, hard-nosed football teams in the country. Uh, to go in there and to uh, you know be able to play and do the things that they were able to do, I think that's just really special. So congratulations to everyone uh, in that effort, and uh, we are very pleased now to be able to represent James Madison University in the 2016 FCS National Championship game, uh, which we played January the 7th in Frisco, Texas, against Youngstown State. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, making preparations for that game and looking forward to the trip down there and hopefully being able to bring back to Harrisonburg, Virginia, the second ever national championship for the JMU Dukes. So with all that being said, any questions about uh, the game last week? Coach Dave Thomas of ESPN Harrisonburg, JMU Sprint Broadcast Network. I know you had your game plan going in. Were you able to stick with what you wanted to do throughout the course of the game, or obviously you had to make some adjustments, or did you yeah. have to dramatically change what your game plan was? I think, you know, especially offensively, it was uh, even more challenging than we anticipated because of the volume of the sound uh, and just the way, the way it forced you to do some things differently. Uh, I thought our coaches made some great adjustments. Uh, I thought that the, uh, you know, a couple, of the, a couple of the tweaks there, they gave us some, uh, some big plays and, in the early in the third early in the fourth quarter after really being uh, stymied pretty good in the, in the third quarter were significant um, you know I felt like defensively we went in with a game plan we were able to execute it and really were able to limit uh, the North Dakota State run game all throughout the game uh, and really you know, putting them in situations where I, I don't think they were as comfortable passing the football so I think on that side of the ball we work Greg Medina DNR with the way your offensive line was, I guess, a little banged up in, in that North Dakota State game, missing Mitchell Kirsch, and then Kyle Rigney got hurt. How did you guys get those freshmen to play as well as they did, especially Mac Patrick, who really hadn't right. seen any significant stats up until that time? Well, I mean, first off, Mac, you know, he's played, you know, periodically throughout the year this year, so he does have a little bit of experience, but I think he is going to be a very, very good player. We're really excited about him uh, and, and have a lot of confidence in him. We didn't hesitate to put him in when Kyle went down. Uh, you know, the biggest thing Kyle has on Mac is he's a fifth-year senior and has tremendous experience. So 
Uh, but, you know, he and Tyree, you know, they've, they've, they've prepared all year for those opportunities. I know that uh, there are some people that have been a little critical of Tyree's play, but uh, I would like for you to line up where you can't hear the snap count. You have to look out of the corner of your eye to see the ball snapped at times, and you have an All-American defensive end over there, you know, flinching and twitching, and you can't hear anything. So uh, he was put in a very challenging situation, uh, and you cannot, no words, can't express how challenging the situation. So I think overall, Tyree actually did a pretty good job. Uh, but I think our offensive line to be able to function in that environment uh, is, is a credit to them. But uh, probably the person that deserves a lot of credit for that whole thing is Brian Shore because he kept his composure. He kept our guys together. Uh, I mean, he, you know, he's having to line everybody up because they can't hear everything, and, and, and you know, it's a chaotic environment. And for him to keep his head the way he did throughout that ball game, you know, probably is the, the singular reason we were able to be as effective as we were offensively. David Guzman, TV3 in Harrisonburg. Uh, with Tyler Gray, uh, could you, one, discuss his growth over the season, and then two, how he was able to mentally handle the situation given everything that happened right. leading up to that moment? Right. Well, I mean, I think you look at Tyler early in the year, and he was inconsistent on extra points. If he missed a field goal, he was guaranteed to miss the second one uh, because he'd, over, he'd overcompensate, and that's whether it's practice or games or whatever. And really, I thought he didn't have a ton of confidence early in the year, which happens with young kickers. You know, this is his first time as a starter. Uh, but I thought the other night demonstrated as much as anything his growth and maturity, uh, you know, as, as a place kicker in big time environments. You know, he has the one hit the upright there early in the game, which, you know, a lot of guys that would get in their head and they'd be done for the night. But, you know, you looked at him come off the field, he was fine. You know, and you, and you knew right then that he was going to be okay later on in the ball game. Uh, and to step up and hit that kick in that situation where the score is tied at 17, where we desperately need to get some momentum back, uh, and, and he hits a 45-yarder, which to me is just probably on the outside fringe of his range. Uh, that, you know, that's a special kick right there. And he had plenty of leg to, 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 to left to spare, too. I mean, he probably was going to be good for 50. Tommy Keeler, Northern Virginia Daily. Can you talk a little bit about uh, John Moore's play and kind of how he stepped up? Well, John, you know, John's played well for us all year long in, in a variety of roles. Uh, we missed him for a couple of games with a minor injury, but, you know, certainly we, we see him as one of our top offensive players. Uh, he does a lot of things without the ball. Uh, certainly he had some huge plays with the ball the other night. Uh, the one on the broken play with Brian that uh, you know, got us down in the red zone. Uh, and then, of course, the, you know, the, the final touchdown, which was a, it was a perfect pass, a great route. John got on top of the DB, got him stacked to where the defender had no chance to make a play on the ball. Uh, anyway, that's just, that's just an example of him and, and what the caliber player he is. Coach, we saw Dimitri make a lot of plays, and Gage right. made a lot of plays from linebacker. How much of what they were able to do came off of what your front four did and what they allowed them to do? I thought that our, our front four was very, very physical. I thought that they, you know, really neutralized uh, the North Dakota State offensive line to a degree, you know, allowing our linebackers to run free. Uh, and, of course, Gage, I think, is playing uh, his best ball of his career right now. Uh, Dimitri, it's good to finally have him back. You know, he was playing very, very well before he got banged up, uh, you know, in the, the, the final third of the season. Uh, and he's back healthy now, and certainly we saw the other night what he's capable of when he's healthy. You know, 16 stops, 10 solos on the night. But, you know, those two guys, and really the way they were playing, and it, to me it was it, the biggest, the best example of, you know, their effectiveness was their, their ability to run down anything that uh, North Dakota State tried to do perimeter-wise. So it really took away that. But then, you know, when they came right at us with their, their traditional power run game, you know, those two were able to sit in there and, and, and really hold their own and neutralize the running backs. To, to follow up on, on David's question about Tyler, for you, what gave you the confidence to, to keep faith in him all year? Because he had been up and down at times. What, what allowed you to put him in that spot and allow him to try that field goal uh, with the game on the line? Well, I mean, one thing about it is I have a strange relationship with kickers, so I'm not – I'm not very nice to him sometimes. And I, I warned him of that back in the spring. He's been called several things. He's had hats thrown at him and stuff like that. But, you know, my whole thing with them is they've got to get to where nothing phases them. You, got, you, got, you have to treat them like crap, really, when they're young. Um, and they get to where they're just so immune to anything outside, you know, of their box. And, uh, 
But you know, Tyler has he has handled everything so well, even even when even when things go bad, because he cares about the team, and that's the reason he has a hard time sometimes or early early on in the year because he didn't want anybody down. But I've seen him out there working after practice. You watch him when we practice. We finish practice. He's out there late. You know, if, if, if he's had a game where he's had a couple of low kicks, you'll see Coach Bowers out there holding the broom up where he has to kick it up over the broom, making him get the ball up fast. Uh, you know, he's a guy that uh, has been tireless with his work ethic to, you know, really perfect his craft. Uh, and we've seen that improvement throughout the year. And so certainly in that situation, we kind of have, you know, here's the cutoff line for him, and then here's kind of the fringe. And I felt like in that situation, we didn't have that much to gain by, you know, trying to pin them on a punt right there versus indoors in that situation with no wind. You know, he probably has the leg to hit that kick, so we elected to go for the kick. Was there any more pressure on this team going into this game versus any other game this year? Because you've made a, a, a constant plan of this week's game is the biggest game of the year. Right. Was that sim a similar approach? Yeah. I mean, I, don't, I, don't, I did not sense anything when it comes to uptightness or anything with the team. In fact, I was worried about it. But, you know, you just saw them, and they were no different than they were any other week. You know, and going up there, they fully expected to win that ball game. I mean, and they, they expected to be the toughest, most physical team on the field, too. And they knew exactly what, you know, they were going up against. They knew the situation with the, the, the noise and all that. But I promise you, our bunch of you to ask them, any time leading up to that ball game, they would have expected to happen what exactly occurred Friday night. So uh, I think that's just, I think that, you know, we've done a pretty good job of preparing them all throughout the year, keeping things focused on what's right in front of them not letting the stage get too big for them at any point in time, and really stressing to them throughout the playoffs that this is no different than any other game. It's going to take nothing different you know, on the field than any other game. They've got to go out and do the things that good football teams do, play at a high intensity level, and play together. That's it. You know, So they know they can do those things. Coach, can you talk a little about uh, the kind of what it's about this team to have a 17 0 lead kind of slip away and then kind of bounce back like they did in the fourth quarter? Right. Well, you know, we, t we talked about it that afternoon because certainly now you're going up against what is, you know, arguably the best team in the country. So you knew that that was going to be a game that was going to be very, very tight. Uh, you knew that that was going to be a game that was going to have some momentum swings. And so, you know, in our, in our final meeting in the afternoon before we went to the stadium, we talked about, you know, listen, there's going to come a point in time in this ball game where they're going to have the momentum and we're going to be really struggling and we're going to have to just stick together focus on the play right in front of us, keep doing the things that we know are important to do, and focus on doing our job, and just somehow fight through it and find a way to get the momentum back. And really, you know, I've equated that third quarter to, you know, you're a heavyweight boxer and you're sitting there and all of a sudden you're in trouble and uh, you know, you're up against the ropes and, and the, the time's running out in the, in the round and you're just trying to get, to get to the end of the round and get to your corner so you can regroup. And really I felt like that's kind of where we were in the third quarter and we just had to have something positive happen. And you know, after they've tied the game, we, we have the turnover. They take over in our, in our territory, you know, right there late in the third. And, you know, it was getting ready to get away from us, but I thought our defense stepped up right there, got the stop got our offense the ball back, uh, the fourth quarter starts, and then all of a sudden we, you know, we have the drive to get into range and time gets the kick, and all of a sudden we have the momentum back, and then everything changes from there. Coach, got a question from uh, Facebook, James Sheasley, who is a military man and used to work uh, as a, tri as a uh, equipment person at JMU football a long time ago. And uh, obviously you're talking about that juncture in the ball game. Certainly mental and physical toughness have to come into play, and you talk about toughness a lot. But his question is, what have, has your staff done that has contributed to developing that toughness the most? What quality have you instilled there? Well, I think it's, I think it, I think it's expectations and accountability on a daily basis. And I think it's the fact that, you know, no matter what the weather is, no matter what the conditions are, no matter what time of year it is, if there's not lightning, we're going to be outside, you know, anytime we're working. So they don't even have to ask. It doesn't, it doesn't be 10 below, it be whatever. As long as there's no lightning, we're outside. Um, you know, we have uh, certain components uh, of practice. We have certain components of their, their training with Coach Williams, which Coach Williams is, is locked arm in arm with me as far as philosophy goes, where we put them in situations where it is challenging physically and even more taxing and challenging mentally and trying to develop that mental toughness because the expectation is not going to change. 
You know, there is no, there's nothing acceptable uh, besides your best and besides giving everything that you have on every single rep, no matter if it's practice, workouts, whatever. But it's that, it's that consistent accountability and expectation that since we got here has been instilled in them that I think has resulted in them being what they are. Um, certainly they have bought in completely and they pride themselves now in having great mental toughness. They pride themselves now in having great physical toughness. And, you know, part of that also probably has to come from the tightness and the unity we have in our locker room. I, I think the, the lightning sometimes might be charged by you, Coach, in some of those speeches that we hear every once in a while. Let's take it back to members of the media. With your preparation beginning for, for Youngstown State, uh, does it help help to have some staff members that have the FBS experience of preparing for a bowl game since so there is such an extended period of time between your last game and this, this championship game? Yeah, I think that uh, I think it's definitely a, a, a great analogy right there because very much what we're treating it like. We're treating it like a bowl game because you have a, a little bit of a break and then you have practice without school in session and then you have a remote location that you're going to. So, uh, you know, when we, when we started developing our schedule, which is what I spent most of the day yesterday doing, uh, you know, you, you bounce stuff off, you know, how does this compare to, you know, the way you would do it preparing for whatever bowl you're going to. So I think that experience was good just from a reinforcing factor of, yeah, that's how we would do it. And that's, you know, here's, here's another idea there because you have so many factors going in from, you know, when you're, when you're shipping your equipment out, you probably still got to practice a little bit after your equipment goes out. You know, uh, fortunately we have several helmets at JMU, so we don't have to worry about that. The helmets are on the truck and headed to Frisco before we are. But, uh, you know, there's just lots of logistical stuff uh, with the whole deal uh, that you got to plan out that's so much different from anything else. Coach, this is your second trip to a national championship. You went in 2013. What did you learn from that trip that might be applicable to the week of, because there are a lot of things going on, and how to keep you and your staff focused going into this one? I think probably two things that I've already talked to our staff about. One of them is, We've got to make sure that the kids are prepared for the stage because it's going to be different. It's going to be different than any of the playoff games because there's going to be so much electricity, there's going to be so much you know ramped up intensity, and all of a sudden you're going to have the national media spotlight on you. So we've got to prepare them for that, you know, during our time to, you know practice. The other thing is we've got to make sure that they get enough rest, you know, the couple of days before before the ball game. You know, when we, when we went in 13. Uh, you know, they have so many activities surrounding the national championship and they have you going here and they have you going there and they have you doing this. I remember getting to our Friday night meeting and, and the players, the only thing they want to do is get some sleep. You know, that coach, can we just get a little bit extra time to sleep? Uh, and that really resonated with me because it was too late then. Uh, and so, especially with 11 a.m. kickoff the next morning, uh, we're going to be very cognizant on Thursday and Friday when we get to Frisco of making sure that they get adequate rest before kickoff. I know you're focused on this championship game, but you did get some good news for the future with a, a player announcing he's coming to JMU in the future. What can you tell us about that? Well, Marcus Marshall has uh, decided he's going to come join uh, our program at JMU, so we're excited to welcome him to the family. Um, you know, we had uh, he and his family here for the game against Sam Houston State, and uh, you know, his dad Warren. I'm sure all all of our alumni know him very, very well. Uh, it was great to get an opportunity to spend some time with him and, and, and Marcus's mom uh, and just really enjoyed the family. But Marcus felt very at home here. Uh, he really uh, meshed with our players uh, and you know, certainly he meshed with Coach Sims and myself and Coach Kirkpatrick. Uh, and we we're very, very excited to add him to the roster moving forward. He'll be here in January. He's already enrolled in classes. He has all his paperwork taken care of so I can publicly talk about him. But uh, we're very excited to have him as an addition to our program. As far as personnel goes for, for the championship game, would you have Kyle Ricky back, and, or is it just too early to tell? And then in terms of the, the suspended what? Work, what was the first? Kyle Ricky. Would you have Kyle Ricky back? Do you think you'd get him back? We, we anticipate having Kyle. And then, yep. and then in terms of the suspended players, do you anticipate any of them being back in the championship game? No. Coach, you're, uh, I guess you're now famous for your pregame speeches thanks to ESPN. I'm wondering uh, what kind of feedback you've gotten from either friends, family, former players, or anyone outside the program now. Well, most of my former players recognize the speeches, or at least uh, the con some of the content in them, so uh, they're used to them. But, uh, you know, it's just, 
You know, I believe this game is played with a lot of intensity. I believe this game is played with a certain mental preparation. Uh, and you know that, that those few moments right before you take the field is the time when you have to be the most focused. Uh, and I think that uh, you know I think a lot of that comes from the connection that the players and our staff has uh, to where you know in that setting in that locker room. I promise you, everybody in there is on the same page, and everybody's in there in the same state of mind. Uh, and so that moment really tells you, you know, if we're ready to play or not. And, uh, and, and those kids, certainly you've, you've had to do a lot before that moment, you know, to be ready to play. But that's, uh, you know, that's when it's getting ready to kick off and, uh, and, and be for real. So uh, that's always an enjoyable time for all of us. Can you talk about how you prepare your schedule when your kids get to go for the holiday, when they return, and then can, how you laid out your plan from there? Well, we, uh, they, we, we got back to Harrisonburg at 8 a.m. Uh, Saturday morning, so uh, just in time to go eat breakfast. But uh, we, we made them go get some sleep. They had to check in uh, midday before they left to go home, so that way I knew that they were still in Harrisonburg for a couple of hours. Uh, and then, uh, you know, they're, they're home with their families right now. Coach Williams has sent them a, uh, a workout that they need to be doing so uh, to make sure that they're not uh, in terrible shape when they get back. But they're going to return next Tuesday evening. We'll start practice uh, next Wednesday, uh, which will give us a full week here in Harrisonburg. Uh, and we'll have basically the same schedule that, we're gonna have, that we had during the bye week heading into the playoffs on a daily basis. Uh, you know, we'll be here over New Year's. So we're planning some stuff for the team for that. Uh, but then we'll fly out to Frisco, uh, Texas on Wednesday, January the 4th. And can you just talk about your your quick exchange with Coach Kleiman at the end of the game? You went and found him. And obviously, you know, having a streak like he had in, right. it's got to be hard on him. But coach to coach, uh, his brotherhood, you've said that before. Just kind of talk about your time with him. Well, I think first is I would have to give him credit for not only the way he conducted himself, but his entire staff and his team. They're as first class of an organization as I have ever competed against uh, from the top down. Uh, and certainly he was as well. Uh, and, I, you know, that was a tough night for him. And, but the first thing that he was talking to me about was just congratulations on my team and their effort. Congratulations on advancing to the national championship game. Uh, you know, we wish you the best of luck. You know, go win it all. Those were his comments. And, you know, mine to him were just – you know, you've had a very special run that you may never see again uh, in the college football landscape that we have. And just, you know, congratulations on a great year, but even more so congratulations on, you know, the last five years of what that program has achieved. So certainly I've, I have a, a greater respect after spending uh, that time with him in that setting during that day and then the way they conducted themselves after the game, which really, that tells you really who people are. Any other questions from members of the media? All right. Merry Christmas. We'll have a couple of weeks off, and we'll see you right before we head to Frisco. Go Dukes. Thank you, Coach Houston. We will be back here on January the 3rd. January the 3rd, we will be back here for our Fan and Press Luncheon. We will have uh, Coach Houston here that day, and the Dukes will depart for Frisco on Wednesday, January the 4th. Thank you for joining us here at O'Neill's Grill, and happy holidays to one and all.